This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. It's good to be with you this morning. My name is Shelley Webb, and I am supply pulpit for uh, Marcus today as he's away from uh, Lake Toxway. But it's so good to be back. You all are such generous and lovey, loving people. Um, are there any announcements? I did see that several of you are back again. I've heard some reunion stories, like we're glad to see you back. So we want to especially welcome those of you who are back in the midst of these mountains. Are there any announcements that you would like to share for the parish? <laughs> well, as Ruth is um, looking for something, <laughs> I will continue. Um, Today is the third Sunday of Lent, and it is a communion Sunday where we will celebrate the Lord's Supper, and I will remind us as a United Methodist congregation that this is the Lord's table, and anyone who desires to be fed and nourished by God's grace is welcome at this table. I'll also mention that as we go through the worship service, as much as I love the Exodus text, <laughs> Um, I'm not going to read that today, but I encourage you to take these things home and to read them as devotional material. Um, it's one of the cornerstones of our faith, the Ten Commandments. And I don't know how many of you have ever memorized that as a kid, <laughs> um, but it's a good reminder just to hold that up and to remember that these are the words of God and expectations of an ethic that we are to live by. If there are no other announcements, I'll invite you to stand and to join me in our opening prayer. Let us pray. O oh God, your weakness is mightier than human strength. Your foolishness is wiser than human wisdom. We rejoice that you are with us today. Open our hearts and discipline our will. Teach us to follow your perfect ways. Test us with your righteous decrees, as with a whip drive us from unholy living, and turn us toward your holy light. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, comfort and redeem us with your holy gospel. Amen. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. Christ is with us. Thanks be to God. Our opening hymn of praise is number 163.
stand on a strong foundation, much of which is listed in this Apostles' Creed. So let us affirm our faith by using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Our scripture reading this morning from the letter of Paul to the Corinthians, hear these words. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are being destroyed, but it is the power of God for those of us who are being saved. It is written in scripture, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and I will reject the intelligence of the intelligent. Where are the wise? Where are the legal experts? Where are today's debaters? Hasn't God made the wisdom of the world foolish? In God's wisdom, he determined that the world wouldn't come to know him through the wisdom. Instead, God was pleased to save those who believed through the foolishness of preaching. Jews ask for signs and Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, which is a scandal to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is God's power and God's wisdom. This is because the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. And now if you'll join me in our responsive reading, Psalm 19. Heaven is declaring God's glory. The sky is proclaiming his handiwork. One day gushes the news to the next, and one night informs another what needs to be known. Of course, there's no speech, no words. Their voices can't be heard. God has made a tent in heaven for the sun. The sun is like a groom coming out of his honeymoon suite. Like a warrior, it thrills at running its course. The Lord's instruction is perfect, reviving one's very being. The Lord The Lord's regulations are right, gladdening the heart. The Lord's commands are pure, giving light to the eyes. Honoring the Lord is correct, lasting forever. The Lord's judgments are true. All of these are righteous. They are more desirable than gold, than tons of pure gold. And they are sweeter than honey, even dripping off the honey. No doubt about it, your servant is enlightened by them. There is great reward in keeping them. But can anyone know what they have to them which are wrong? Clearly of any unknown sin. And save your servant from willful sins. Don't let them rule me.
And now hear the reading of the gospel text from, it was actually last Sunday's gospel reading, but it fits so well with the epistle reading about the cross that I wanted to hear it again. Hear the words taken from the gospel of Mark, chapter 8, verses 31. Then Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed and after three days, rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, Jesus rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers... Let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? The word of the Lord for the people of Christ. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Oh God, you take many words to help us see light in dark times. You give us the boundaries of holy living that we might fulfill your call to be light to the world. Hear now these words, O oh God, and make them be for us your word. Amen. Amen. We all know that someone, don't we? You know, without pointing a finger here this morning, we all know that person who we secretly admire to be more like. My friend is... Jeremy, and he's the person I want to be more like, and it's a strange reason why I want to be more like him. You see, he still uses a flip phone. <laughs> That's what, you just saw me using my cell phone to read the scripture, but he uses a flip phone, and Jeremy loves it. He has plenty of money that he could choose another type of phone, but he's so content with his flip phone. I saw him at a clergy meeting like three weeks ago, and he was trying to send a text. Well, he does. He sends texts to people, but he like clicks the same button three times to get to the letter that he wants. <laughs> he is content. He's like that. He's not tempted by shiny and new and faster. So me, on the other hand, since this is the season of confession, I am tempted every time Apple comes out with a new phone. I mean, last May, after I ran the White Squirrel 5K race, I accidentally dropped my iPhone 4, and I confess, deep down, I was thrilled that I was going to have to go and buy a new phone, an iPhone 7. And with a brand slogan that says, think different, who couldn't resist? I mean, I want to think differently. I want to be different, admire different. Rolling out the iPhone is genius marketing that Apple uses to draw us in. And yet, it's another thing to sell a message like the one Jesus was offering in today's readings. It's hard to draw people in, especially if your slogan is something like, take up your cross and follow me. Or even from the letter of Corinthians, Paul says, the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, the cross is the power of God. We really have no idea how radical, how offensive even the words of Jesus really were to those who first heard him. For us, you see, the cross has become, you know, a sacred symbol of faith. We have them around our necklaces. We have them 
center of our worship. I've even seen people with crosses tattooed on their arms. But to read this text accurately, we, we need to remember those who were following Jesus would have found even the mere mention of a cross as horrifying. Some scholars say that it was genius move on the part of the Roman government to institute crucifixion as a means of execution in the Roman government's attempts to sort of take over as much of the ancient world as it could. The Roman government wanted to make sure that their neighbors knew that they were serious. It was the law that Roman citizens would not be crucified. They couldn't be crucified. But to anyone who was a criminal from other territories or just neighbors who were making threatening offense, you could be crucified. During a crucifixion, the punished, as we know, was nailed between two large beams, and they were left exposed to the elements until those people died. The primary goal of crucifixion was, of course, to provide a particularly painful, public, gruesome way to usher people out of this world. It was to shame them. It was to degrade their families and all who knew them. Well, you can imagine the effects of such a violent method of execution in a society in which it happened. There was violence, there was fear, horror. These are the side effects of public crucifixions, death by cross. And they worked. It worked to keep people in line. I could go on, but I think you get the picture. <laughs> Whatever religious or sacred significance you and I have assigned to the symbol of the cross was certainly not present in the minds of those who followed Jesus. So you can imagine their confusion. It helps. They heard his words, take up your cross. Was he crazy? As Paul said, it baffled people. Was it foolishness? Truthfully, while we have managed to sort of sanitize the symbol of the cross sufficiently that we can even close our eyes and sing a number of beloved hymns, which we will even do today, it's hard. Even we have taken these and other words of Jesus and we can easily create some theological constructs that have resulted in some pretty dangerous ideas. Just think, from certain passages in our Bible, Christians have come to believe that humans are what? They're depraved, and therefore they deserve whatever suffering comes our way. That's not what United Methodists believe, but in the theology of suffering, some Christians take these texts and they Make them say things that were never intended. Or what about this one? Or we have to suffer. Have you ever heard that? We, we have to suffer. It's what we do in exchange for God's love. Or if we grit our teeth long enough and hard enough and manage to survive our suffering, then we can get eternal life. Or there is some hidden virtue in suffering. And in fact, we should look for suffering so that we can become better people. Some Christians would say it's right there in Mark's gospel. Here, Jesus is explaining to his disciples how he was going to have to go through some pretty horrible experiences. I don't think God ever wants to glorify suffering just to make us get in line. Jesus was trying to correct his disciples of any misconceptions about who he was and what he had come to do. You know, a lot of folks had been taken by Jesus. They had followed him because he was performing miracles. Some were looking for a political leader, and all through the Gospel of Mark, the disciples and others were forever misunderstanding him. So here he kind of sets them straight. It's not what he really ultimately wanted to do. No human, no God wants anyone to suffer. But he sets them straight and says, the Son of Man will undergo great suffering. 
parenthetically, because God loves us that much. He's willing to be rejected. He's willing to be killed. Not to glorify violence, but to glorify how devoted he was to the human race. So then Peter, because that's not what he envisioned a king would do, ever helpful, he's the one who's always speaking for us who are misunderstanding, he starts protesting, as many of us would have done if we had been in his sandals. So Jesus stops Peter's protest rather forcefully, and if you ask me, he launched into his famous speech, the one that has birthed so many of these unfortunate theories of suffering. He said, if you want to be my follower, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. Where I think we get it significantly wrong when it comes to suffering, all of those theological constructs that I mentioned, they tend to focus on us, what we can do to get eternal life, or what we should be striving for. When Jesus was trying so very hard to get us to focus on what God is doing, what God is always willing to do, Theologians will tell you that all of this theorizing about suffering is not unique to the Christian perspective. In fact, most would say that it is the most pressing question of every world religion, of every human being. Why do we suffer? Why do we suffer? It's what keeps us awake at night, trying to understand why there is suffering in this world. If you live long enough, my dad used to tell me, you will suffer at some point. If you've loved anything or anyone, at some point, your heart will break. We struggle, we as humans. We fail. We feel longing towards something that we miss. We want things to happen. We hurt when other people hurt, and nobody has a really great explanation, most of all because the topic of suffering is not one that you and I are flocking to explore in great detail. We, we kind of shove suffering conversations under the rug. We don't want that. Even Billy Graham, who this week we celebrated his life and his witness to this world, even Billy Graham once said that he could not understand human suffering in totality. The thing he did understand was that God is with us. He wondered why God allows it to happen, and he didn't have a good answer for that, but even as it happens, he said that God is with us. Jesus' disciples heard Jesus talking about suffering, and they were running in the opposite direction, just like we do. They had pinned every hope they carried on him. They desperately wanted a way out of pain, out of their human experience. And there he was. There's Jesus. He had all the makings of a, of a great king, of a great politician. He even had a great uh, view as a social worker. He cared about those on the margins of life. He was a great physician. He healed people. He fed people. He was a wise sage. He even was a best friend, someone who would deliver them once and from all for their Roman domination, from the pain of their poverty, from their eternal quest to make their lives mean something. So Peter said it out loud, but I, I bet they were all thinking the same thing. See, they didn't have any interest in talking about their pain. They didn't want to be in pain. That was the whole point of following a charismatic leader, to get them out of it. They certainly had no interest in hearing this one on whom they were pinning their most lofty hopes, talking about something as horrifying as a cross. No, they wanted the problem of human suffering, of doubt, of pain, of all of their uncertainty gone. I remember a day when human 
suffering left most of us, I would say all of us, without words. It was my first day of a much needed vacation and the day was September 11th, 2001. And I remember the shock I had waking up to see the devastation played out on the morning news. I was headed to the Grand Canyon. I had never been to the Grand Canyon. It would be the first time I would get to see that enormous beauty. But because of the tragedy that was unfolding, it was the surreal drive I had through the arid land. It was hot for that fall day. It was driving down roads, following a map, because back then we didn't have GPS, and roads were blocked. The way I was headed, the, they were blocked, and I had to figure out a different way to get there. And I didn't know if I should even go, but I couldn't come back home because all the flights were canceled. I was the pastor at St. Timothy United Methodist Church, and I felt bad that I was not with my flock. I didn't know what I was supposed to do. I was supposed to be having fun, but I couldn't even enjoy it. Finally, I made it to the rim of the canyon just as the sunset tour was getting underway. And still feeling overwhelmed in a daze, really, I followed the National Park tour guide who just happened to be this Hopi native woman. And she led our small huddled mass to the edge of the rim just as the sun was setting on that day. Some in the group had not even heard the news. It was like a little international group of people. You know how these huge attractions draw many people from many lands. And many of us had, and many of us still were in shock because we did know the news. And there we stood looking out over the vast canyon that I had never seen before. It was breathtaking. Our Hopi guide invited us all to acknowledge the pain of that particular day. And we sat there in silence, watching the sunset, gazing down into that mighty river that looked to us from that perspective as a, a tiny ribbon, a creek maybe. And she spoke and she said, in all of this pain, just receive this vision, this moment as a gift. She explained that no one sees the canyon anymore as her ancestors did many, many years ago without planes or helicopters flying through it. She said, for once, it's still, it's calm. The sound was just silence. She went on to say that for centuries there have always been human devastation, some caused by natural disasters, some caused by human violence some just by human loss. And yet the river, miles below us, continued to flow with power and grace, just as it had done for millions of years, carving out that grand canyon. You know, Jesus is doing the most ridiculous thing in this passage, and Paul refers to it in Corinthians when he refers to this ridiculous idea of a cross as being a balm. He is naming the pain that all of us carry. He is acknowledging that every human life will experience suffering, and he is suggesting that perhaps the be-all and end-all of every human life is not to simply alleviate the suffering, it's something impossible to do at times, but rather to find our identity in following Jesus. Jesus wanted his disciples to know that if you want to be my follower, you will suffer. Standing up for what you believe in, being compassionate, meaning to suffer with others, which is what Christians do. We work to proclaim the gospel, the good message, and it may seem counterculture to a world that believes in love rather than violence. It acknowledges our creative power of God at work in this world, healing the things that seem impossible. Setting off in this direction, Jesus says, may very well cost you your very life. It is counterculture. It may seem to the world as foolish to live one's life following in line 
behind a processional cross. Jesus was already strongly suspecting that it would cost him his. That's why he wanted the disciples not to be blindsided. See what I mean about a hard sell? Take up your cross and follow me. The power of the cross. It's the grand paradox. We find meaning of our lives, the ease to our pain, the sense that we are home and all is right with the world, not with any quick fix to make things feel better. No, Jesus told his disciples that day, and he tells us something just as hard. We gain the very meaning of our lives when we give our lives away. When we look at our lives and we see the suffering we experience, and when we decide regardless of that, I'm going to follow Jesus. You know, it's no wonder I think that the foot of the cross was so sparsely populated the day that Jesus died. They'd all fled because it was so hard to witness. There was nothing about that specter of the cross that proclaims, take it easy, or there's not going to be any more pain in the world. And these are certainly not the sort of messages that Jesus offers you and me this very day. Instead, here is the invitation, I think, our scripture asks us and tells us. The invitation is to look your greatest fear and your deepest pain straight in the eyes. That's the pick up your cross part. This pain and struggle are part of human living, and then it goes on to say, refuse to let the pain structure your life or define your existence, or motivate your living. Instead, Jesus says, come on and follow me. Because it is by acknowledging the suffering and fear by God's grace, by getting up to follow anyway, that you move through the pain, that we will finally discover who we really, really are. God would say, this is who you really, really are. Even as you suffer, I'm with you. But you are precious. You are precious people of God. And as the prophet Isaiah said, have you not known? <laughs> have you not heard? It is God who sits above the earth, above the circle of the earth. It is God who sits above the Grand Canyon. <laughs> Those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Amen. Amen. We continue now in our worship by receiving our gifts of tithes and offerings as we give them back to God.
Gracious God, we respond to your great gifts to us by offering these gifts to you. We bring gifts of money, of time and talents, and the gift of our lives. May we declare your praise in ways that sweeten lives with the love of Christ. Amen. Remain standing as we sing our hymn of preparation for Holy Communion, number 297. invite you to turn into your bulletin and follow along in the bold type as we celebrate God's holy meal. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. In the wilderness, you gave Moses your commandments that those who were wandering might become your people. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, 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 holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ, who cleansed the temple of unrighteous activities and foretold his resurrection from the dead. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took the bread, gave thanks to you, broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, he gave thanks to you, 
He gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. To remember him thus is foolishness to the wisdom of our age. But your foolishness is greater than our wisdom and your weakness greater than our strength. And so in remembrance of these your mighty acts, in Jesus Christ we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice and union with Christ offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine and make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. And by your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at the heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, now and forever. Amen. And now, with the confidence of the children of God, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf. The bread which we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. And the cup over which we give thanks is a sharing in the blood of Christ. The table is prepared for all who hunger and thirst for righteousness. May you come as the ushers instruct us.
join me in the prayer following the communion. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves to others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 40 in the supplemental hymnal. place. Let us go shining light into a world. May we go as compassionate people, followers of Jesus Christ. May the God of grace and glory go with us all and the power of the Holy Spirit be our friend. Amen.